Hanako-san giggled as she waited for her classmates to burst into the bathroom at any moment. It was her turn to be sought. She was in a cheerful mood that afternoon. After all, she was finally starting to fit in after being ridiculed for months. No one trusted her after her parents were labeled as traitors for protesting against the war. She didn't believe it though. To her, it was simply a rumor. Her parents told her that they were going on a trip, and she had faith that they would soon return and pick her up from school. The adults knew the truth, but didn't have the heart to tell her that her parents were thrown in jail and killed for their crimes. That's how Hanaku-san ended up in this orphanage. She yawned. The sun was starting to set, and an hour had gone by. No footsteps, no tiny voices calling out her name. And Hanaku-san realized her classmates weren't looking for her. She sighed, crawled out of her hiding spot, and was about to open the bathroom door when... May couldn't wait for recess. She hated school and always felt like an outsider. For some reason, she always had a hard time making friends. It didn't help that she didn't share the same hobbies as the kids around her age. She was more old-fashioned, preferring printed books where she could turn the crisp new pages, the sound of nature, and oldies music. Not that she was picked on for her preferences, but she didn't know which was worse, being bullied or ignored. And that's why she would sneak out during some of her classes and eat lunch in the third floor girl's bathroom. It wasn't bad at all. She enjoyed the acoustics there if she wanted to blast music, or the solitude if she wanted to read. Most faculty and students avoided that part of the school. They found it creepy. But for May, this was her safe place, and she had company. She managed to make one friend in that school, Hannah. She was maybe a year or two younger than May and she was like a younger sister. She remembered the day she met her like it was just yesterday. After not doing so well on her math test, May headed to the bathroom for some peace and quiet. As she entered the room, she heard a little girl crying and saw Hannah sitting inside the third stall, wiping away her tears. May calmed her down, and from that day on, the two girls met up and hung out there almost every day. Hannah didn't speak though, and May didn't bother asking her questions about school. Not in there, where they were escaping it. The two girls would spend most of their afternoons in the girls' bathroom. Listening to music, drawing, and playing games like hide-and-seek. It was Uneventful every time, even though it was such a tiny space, Hannah insisted on being the hider. It always made her giggle, <laughs> but then she'd frown after she was found and just look out the window as if she was waiting for someone. May never understood the reason why she was always sad and quiet, but she respected Hannah's privacy. She knew her friend would tell her when she was ready. During lunch the next day, May got caught up finishing her science project. She was forced to partner with Ren, one of the popular kids who didn't even know she existed before having to work together. Why don't I ever see you during lunch? Ren asked. May didn't look up. I prefer eating by myself. Can we focus, please? I have somewhere to be. Where? It's lunchtime. Ren was confused. May sighed. This boy was too nosy for his own good. The third floor. Oh, you're the weird girl who goes to the bathroom there every day? May was getting annoyed. Ren wasn't even doing any work, but would take all the credit. Do you believe in yokai? May didn't respond. How about Anaku-san? She looked up from their project. Who? 
Before Ren could answer, the bell rang and they had to return to class. As soon as all the students sat down in history class, Ren raised his hand to ask a question. Can you tell us about the ghost in the school? Now, this was everyone's favorite class. Their teacher was young and down to earth. Sure, why not? We have a few minutes before I can start today's lesson. And the teacher explained the legend. As many of you may know, this school was once an orphanage. Unfortunately, during World War II, it was bombed and not a single person survived. Many of the parents of orphans who lived here were killed during the war, whether they were fighting in the war or labeled as traitors. Yeah, 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 but can you tell us about Anaku-san? Well, supposedly, one of the orphans became an evil spirit after she passed, and to this day, haunts this school. People say she was playing hide-and-seek in the girls' bathroom upstairs when the building was bombed. To this day, it's still her favorite game. Now, her poor spirit is stuck in that bathroom, in the third stall where she passed, and why we are all forbidden from going up there out of respect. Because if you ask if she is there three times and knock, you might anger her. She might choose to reveal herself, grab you, and flush you down the toilet, down to the fiery pits of hell. The class laughed. Yeah, May said she hangs out there all the time. I'm surprised she's still alive. Her classmates looked at her and laughed more. She's nice. Because you've seen her? Or are you friends? Everyone continued laughing at her. The teacher had to yell at the students to quiet down so that she could continue with her lesson. As soon as they were dismissed, May stormed out of the room. She was furious. But while she was walking down the hallway, Ren pushed her to the side and ran to the staircase. May started running after him when she realized where he was going. When she got to the bathroom, Ren was already there. Anaku-san, are you there? He knocked on the stall's door. May pleaded for him to stop. Anaku-san, are you there? He knocked again. No response. But the door opened. Anaku-san wasn't there. Ren shrugged his shoulders and entered the stall. Then he sat on the toilet and started passing gas. May was mortified, and she tried to pull him off of the toilet, but he wouldn't budge. Ren just laughed, finished doing business, flushed, and finally stood up. He continued making fun of May as he washed his hands. May had enough. Why don't you ask it one last time? May dared. <sighs> Anaku-san... Are you there? Ren knocked again. The lights started flickering. Ren was confused. How did you do that? They watched as the door opened on its own. Then there was a gurgling sound coming from the toilet. The two of them just stared at it as it started shaking. And then they heard a tiny voice. I am here. You found me. Out of nowhere, a long bloody hand popped out of the toilet, reaching out until it could grab the boy's legs before he could escape and pull him into the toilet. Ren screamed and cried as he whirled around in the dirty water. Then he was flushed down, followed by dead silence. Slowly, Anaku-san's head emerged from the toilet. She got out. Mei was amazed and terrified at the same time. Anaku-san and Mei just stared at each other for a moment. Her friends still looked the same, but now she understood her better. Then Anaku-san smiled and the two
two pals left. The smell of blood, feces, and urine filled the air. It was so strong that it woke me up. The last thing I remembered was running after I opened the last bathroom stall. I just remember tripping on my shoelace and hitting my head on the ground. I slowly touched my head and noticed blood trickling from the fresh gash. I must have blacked out after I fell. I scanned the room and saw my friend Rick laying in front of the last stall. His hands were covered in blood. Rick! I called out. I saw him twitch when he heard his name and wake up. He got up, then screamed while looking inside the cubicle and ran away. As soon as he saw his crimson stained hands, he cried in horror. What happened, Rick? I pleaded for a response. I carefully stood up while holding my head. I looked at Rick, who was now crying in a fetal position. I slowly worked my way to the last stall and vomited when I saw what got Rick in shambles. There was blood splattered everywhere. Tim was decapitated. His head was floating inside the toilet bowl. I looked at Rick and choked when I got a good whiff of the strong iron scent. I didn't do it, Rick kept repeating. I backed away from him. From the corner of my eye, I caught a glimpse of the inside of the next cubicle. Sean was sitting on the toilet. He wasn't breathing. His skin was all blue, and he had dark marks on his neck, like fingerprints. His body fell over. I don't remember anything else after that because I blacked out again. I woke up sprawled on the bathroom floor. Next to me was Rick, whose bloody hands were in handcuffs. He was crying hysterically. The paramedics were in the process of moving Sean's bluish corpse out of the room. Students and teachers were outside the door trying to peek inside. The police closed off the crime scene with tape. The smell of blood still filled the air. I looked inside the stall again and could see Tim's head still in the toilet. Rick and I were escorted into a police car past the students. Their eyes were full of anger as they watched. They thought we were murderers. Halloween should have been fun, but it turned out to be the thing that would ruin my life and kill others. My friends and I decided to create a horror pop-up for the Halloween event. We used our creativity to make it thrilling and fun. We had no desire to harm anyone. We were a group of four outcasts who came together thanks to our love of all things horror. Well, two now. Tim and Sean are dead, while Rick and I are the prime suspects behind their tragic deaths. After our medical checkup, Rick and I were brought to a small interrogation room. We sat in awkward silence for an hour. I heard distant chatter and noticed a security camera hanging on the ceiling. After a while, I finally decided to ask him something. Rick. What happened? He was avoiding my eyes, and his whole body was shaking. He finally calmed down and was about to say something. Then the door opened. It was the lead investigator of our case. He introduced himself as Officer Wren. He sat in one of the empty chairs. He examined our faces, then focused on Rick. You were about to tell Emmy something. Start at the beginning, he commanded. Rick expressed his desire to go home. Then tell me the truth. So we can catch the culprit and set you free, the investigator said calmly. Rick was staring at the ceiling. I didn't kill Tim or Sean. I told them we had the worst idea for this Halloween pop-up. Your group converted the restroom into a horror booth and made it as realistic as possible, right? The investigator asked while taking notes. We were told to present something from Japanese culture or folklore. Rick pointed his finger at me. It was her stupid idea to summon the Akamanto. I wanted to do something more mainstream like the grudge. was caught off guard. What is this Akamanto? The investigator interrupted. Her Halloween design was inspired by the Akamanto. It's a Japanese urban legend about a malicious spirit who appears to individuals using public or school restrooms. It is masked and dressed in a red cloak. Sean was wearing a red cloak, the investigator recalled. It was my idea to dress up and act out the legend. Anyone who entered the restroom was supposed to be asked if they preferred red or blue toilet paper after doing their business, I admitted. The police investigator narrowed his eyes. And in this legend, what happens if someone says blue? 
They will be strangled until they're suffocated and turn blue. Rick quickly answered. However, we decided to just spray blue paint on those who chose blue and red paint on those who chose red. The investigator tilted his head in confusion. So, Tim selected red toilet paper? We nodded simultaneously. Yes, and he was going to be sprayed in red paint so that it could look like blood, I said. Then Officer Wren sighed and lost his cool. Why was his head floating in the damn toilet then? Because he chose red. That means death by decapitation or a slit throat. Is this a joke to you? The investigator stood up. He was about to start lecturing us when his phone vibrated. Mm. And he received a message from his team about the legend of Akamanto. He sat down and read it silently. Then he murmured, What the heck is wrong with you two? A few days had passed, and we didn't get much rest. The pop-up was supposed to be a redeeming moment, for me to prove everyone wrong and regret ever belittling me. But it became too real. The spirit with a red cape actually appeared. We were back in the interrogation room. Rick started talking. Emmy tasked Sean and Tim to spray paint on anyone who used the bathroom. We removed the toilet paper from each stall, so when they had to wipe, they would be asked if they wanted red or blue toilet paper. While Emmy and I were both assigned to the entrance of the bathroom. He was right. I recall that two students came out of the restroom, smiling after having their hair sprayed with blue and red paint. Then minutes later, Sean came out and said Tim had a sudden stomach ache and was going number three. The smell was so strong that we had to temporarily close the bathroom. Sean had a stomach ache too after a few minutes. He tried to look for another bathroom, but it was too far away. He put on his mask to protect his nose and enter the bathroom. And that was the last time we saw him alive. We wondered why the two never came out. So I asked Rick to check on them. I heard Rick screaming, so I followed him to the restroom. I saw him trying to keep Tim's body intact. Then I saw a floating red cloak, so I tried to run away, but my head hit the stall and I passed out. Officer Wren slammed his fist on the table. I'm not here to listen to your bullshit! Two kids died, and both of you are suspects. He pushed the table. Officer Wren escorted us to a cell and said he would ask us questions again later. I'm leaving you two for now. When I come back, both of you better tell me the truth. He started to walk away. He suddenly stopped and looked back at us. Get your story straight, or else you can kiss the rest of your youth goodbye. As soon as he left, the camera on the ceiling pointed towards us. This isn't our fault. We can figure this out. My uncle's a lawyer, I said softly. What? Akamanto was your idea. You have to take the blame, Rick yelled. I walked to the other side of the cell. Me? Take all the blame? What a jerk. It was at that moment that we heard the sound of a toilet flushing. Our eyes widened when we realized that there was a toilet behind us. We both stared at it. I could see the cold sweat dripping from Rick's face. The light flickered for a moment. We heard another flush, then another, and another. Whoever was controlling the toilet was clearly doing it on purpose, and then it stopped. We started backing away from the toilet. Rick screamed for help. He was shaking the bars, but it didn't budge. We braced ourselves for anything that would come out of the toilet, but nothing happened. Could it be that there was just an earthquake and it triggered the flush and messed with the lighting? That's probably what Rick was thinking, because he had a smile on his face as he started walking towards the toilet. What? Are you thinking that the Akamanto would follow us here? He started peeing. I smiled sheepishly. Then suddenly, a voice spoke from inside the toilet. What color cloak? Red or blue? The voice asked. Cloak? You said it only asks about toilet paper color. We knew that if he responded red, the Akamanto would slit his throat. If he answered blue, then the entity would grab his neck and suffocate him till he turned blue. The spirit in a red cloak came out of the toilet. Just choose one. You have to or else- Shut up! Let me think. Rick interrupted me. Okay, I choose blue. The Akamanto wrapped his hands around Rick's neck and started choking him. I could hear Rick gasping for air and then dead silence. I knew I was next. 
After Rick's body collapsed to the ground, Akamanto turned to me. Now you, red or blue? I remained silent and just stared at it. After a few minutes, it disappeared. I forgot to mention, the only way to outsmart the Akamanto and have it leave you alone is to not respond. The sight was gruesome. Skeletons and mummified corpses were spread equally apart, hanging from the ceiling and twined in cobwebs. I nearly vomited at the sight. I knew that I would be next if I didn't leave, but I froze at the sight of thousands of spiders. I closed my eyes and opened them again, hoping that when I did, all of this would prove to be just a dream. That's when I heard the voice of a woman, singing the most beautiful, haunting melody. I went to Japan to finish writing my book, a love story between a foreigner and a Japanese woman, not knowing I would come across a different tragedy. The Izu Peninsula is well known for its beautiful coastlines and picturesque mountains. I made it to my Airbnb, a remote villa on a hill. I needed a quiet place to concentrate on the last chapters of my novel. As I waited for the host to welcome me, a gurgling sound from behind the house caught my attention. I walked towards it. For a moment, the dense, humid air made me feel as though I was choking. But then a sudden breeze filled my lungs as I walked towards a cliff. I found myself standing right next to a majestic waterfall. I was admiring it when an old lady greeted me. She turned out to be the host and mentioned that she was staying nearby with her daughter in case I needed anything. She handed me the keys to the guest house and walked away. The Airbnb was perfect and clean. Mats covered the floor and paper panels on the walls. After I unpacked my belongings, I decided to go for a quick swim in the water. On the way there, I noticed little spiders on the ground. They were crawling towards an abandoned house, not far away from where I was staying. I'm deathly afraid of spiders. The sight of it made me queasy. I tried my best to ignore the critters and went swimming. Although quite cold, the water was refreshing. When I got out, the heat from the sun warmed my skin. I laid down for a bit to dry off. I closed my eyes and ended up napping. I was awakened when I felt something bite my arm. I opened my eyes and saw a web-like string wrapped around it. Slowly, I was dragged into the water. I managed to free myself against some rocks and pull myself to safety. I looked at my arm and saw a red bump and passed out immediately after. When I woke up, a pretty woman was taking care of me. She introduced herself as Yumiko, the daughter of the old woman that I talked to earlier. She was alluring, seductive, and intriguing. Before I could introduce myself, she left, and her mother entered the room with a bowl of soup. I devoured all the contents of the bowl as I was famished. Her mother stepped out of the room, and Yumiko returned. I was careful not to make advances as Yumiko, despite her flirting, but I couldn't help it. The next few days were almost dreamlike. Yumiko and I had grown close. I was welcomed into their home, where I was served delicious local dishes. Afterwards, I'd feel drained but brushed it off as jet lag. I noticed that she never went into the same room as her mother. She would enter the room after her mother had left maybe out of respect. But then my health slowly deteriorated. I was so confused, but perhaps it was an allergic reaction. 
I vomited blood in the old woman's presence, and for a second, caught her smiling. I apologized and immediately went back to the Airbnb because I was creeped out. I was constantly uninspired and lethargic, so I decided to visit the nearest hospital. After some testing, the doctor informed me that my symptoms were those of poisoning, particularly caused by the venom of spiders. I instantly remembered the spiders from when I first arrived. So I decided to do more investigation as soon as I was discharged from the hospital. I brought a lighter, pocket knife, and a fountain pen for protection and if I was hit with inspiration. As I neared the abandoned house near the Airbnb, I noticed a small trail of spiders making its way through a small crack. I turned the doorknob and entered, and saw several men mummified in spider webs. Small spiders surrounded the room. I stepped on the victim's remains as the critter slowly crawled towards me. At the same time, I heard a woman's voice singing a beautiful tune. I was mesmerized, but my phobia of spiders overpowered my desire to follow the music. In my panicked state, I managed to set the room on fire with a lighter and run far away. As soon as the house burst into flames, I heard Yumiko's mother scream. The old woman saw me running away and cursed me. I ran back to the Airbnb and packed my things. As I was about to head out the door, I heard the melody from earlier. I was mesmerized. It was Yumiko singing. I thought of the spiders again, snapped out of it, and covered my ears. When I opened the door, I was shocked to see that grinning in front of me was Yumiko's upper body attached to long, hairy spider legs. I managed to squeeze past the half-woman, half-spider demon and run away. When I looked back, I saw that it was following me. I sprinted. Out of nowhere, Yumiko jumped in front of me. She grinned. She began producing blobs of silk, one after another, and aimed them at me. When she laughed, I realized she was attempting to ensnare me. She snarled and shot another blob towards me. It hit me right in the face. I was blinded by it. I fell to the floor face down, terrified. And just like any spider, she moved silently. I felt her hairy legs on my body and the spinning web around my legs. Then, I felt a bite on my arm, followed by an immediate, sharp pain. My shirt became damp as blood seeped out. Suddenly, I remembered the items in my pocket. I knew I didn't have much time. My hand was free, so I grabbed whatever I could and struck the beast with my pen. Her hairy legs tried to strangle me. I used the pocket knife to cut them off. The creature stepped back. She tried to flee, but collapsed to the ground. I pulled out my lighter, set her on fire, and ran into town. Ironic. I had neglected writing during this retreat, but my pen saved me. My nerves were still on edge as I entered the plane. I booked the first flight out of Japan. I tried to smile at the crew as they welcomed me to the plane, but I could tell that they could sense I was an anxious mess. I walked to my seat. I was relieved to have the whole row to myself. I sat down immediately, asked the flight attendant for a glass of wine, and chugged it. Soon, the plane took off. The captain announced that we were already cruising 20,000 feet above the ground. 
The wine hit me rather quickly since I had an empty stomach. I knocked out almost instantly. Then I awoke to the sound of screams. When I opened my eyes, I saw the flight attendant staring at me in shock. She didn't stop shrieking and pointing at me. I looked down. Hundreds of spiders were crawling out of the wound on my arm. My son returned home with a bandage on his face. He handed me a medal as he beamed with joy. He said that he won the 100 meter dash in his school's track and field tournament, but tripped as he neared the finish line as he wasn't able to control his speed. His face planted to the ground. I asked you not to join any running contests. Half of me wanted to hug and congratulate him, but the other half was worried about his wound. I tried to replace the bandage, but the wound dried up. The bruise darkened, then faded away. This wasn't new to me, because my son exhibited special abilities ever since he was born. I was assaulted by an evil half-horse, half-human creature called Dikbalang. Ten years later, the thought of it still shakes me to the core. But why, Mom? Ian asked, shaking me from my painful past. I don't want you to get hurt. But the truth was, I was afraid that people would learn of his special abilities. My phone vibrated, and I checked the notifications. It was a Facebook memory, a picture of two men who were members of the hiking group I was once a part of. Who are they? Ian asked as he curiously looked at my screen. They were my best friends. It was ten years ago, but I still feel the pain of losing my first boyfriend and best friend. I'll never forget the day that Dick Balang killed them. The acidity of its smell, the smoke that blurred my vision, its stiff, unyielding body, and his monstrous appearance. I'm always filled with dread when I think about what will happen to my son in the future. I recall the Albulario, who warned me that the Dick Balang would return. Is everything okay, hon? My husband Jordan asked. I didn't notice he came home. Dad, I won the track and field competition even without running shoes. Ian showed off his medal. Really? Wow. I will buy you a pair so you can practice. He gave Ian a hug. My husband Jordan helped me forget my dark past. Best of all, he treats my son like his own. My knight in shining armor. My father died. We need to go to my hometown, Jordan said somberly. I'm sorry for your loss, honey. I told my husband... Ian and I are always here for you. He was always there for me, so I promised that I would comfort him in these trying times. I didn't expect, however, that his province was near the Devil's Mountain, which I swore I would never return to. Jordan's house in Risal Laguna was located near the foot of the mountain of San Cristobal. I recognized the same eeriness from years ago. Dark, foggy, demonic... I warned my son not to go close to the mountain. Then Jordan gave him a pair of shoes that he bought while we were on our way to Laguna. This is your reward. Ian shouted in excitement, put them on and ran to test it. I tried running after him, but he was too fast and disappeared. I was nervous when he didn't come back, but after a few minutes, he was back, celebrating his new running shoes. He wanted to run some more, but I told him that it was getting dark. He was stubborn. Until we heard faint thuds that scared the life out of me. Jordan, whatever happens, please protect our son, I urged my husband. Why are you overreacting? What's going on? He asked. The faint thuds disappeared. Jordan dismissed it as a hiker's footsteps. Jordan had to leave to prepare for his father's funeral. While Ian and I were having dinner, I heard faint thuds again. And then it became louder. It could be the Balbal, Ian hypothesized. I hugged my son and we went to our room. I locked the door and all the windows. I tried to peek out the window and saw the silhouette of a half-horse, half-man leaving the area. The creature might have left because of the arrival of the funeral parlor's car. They carefully placed the casket in front of the house and soon visitors arrived. 
Out the window, I saw Jordan mingling with guests. Then I felt drowsy. I closed my eyes, and I was tired from the trip. I saw the eyes of the demon monster fiery with sulfur. It was staring at me and grinning as it took a big bite out of a boy who was sobbing. I woke up and saw the head of the demon horse peeking through our open window. It had blood on its mouth, and he revealed his razor-sharp teeth. I quickly thought of my son, who should have been sleeping beside me, but he was gone. It was then that I felt someone shaking me. Honey, you're having a nightmare. We got- I realized it was just a dream. I was relieved. Where is Ian? Jordan asked me. I immediately looked at the window and saw that it was open just like in my dream. Ian was missing. Rumors had spread that my son was missing. The townspeople looked around the neighborhood. They noticed big marks of big hooves that looked like it came from a very big horse. An elder mentioned the Dikbalang that resided in the mountain, but everyone laughed. The Dikbalang would never leave the mountain, a woman said. They said it was harmless and only played tricks on hikers. Upon my pleading, Jordan asked the mounted rangers to look for our son in Mount San Cristobal. When they didn't return, I became restless. I asked Jordan to come with me to look for Ian in the Devil's Mountain, but he refused. I wasn't sure if it was because he was afraid or if he was too busy with his father's wake, so I decided to go to the mountain by myself. I embarked on my journey despite the sun shower. The trail was uphill and had too many trees. It was slippery and took me until night to reach the middle of the forest, where I believe the Dick Balang resided. A massive bolt of lightning struck the sky, followed by deafening thunder. Although the rain had ceased, it appeared that another downpour was on the way. I was terrified of the lightning, but it helped light my way. I endeared the eerie mountain, loud howls, whispers, and even the sight of the mountain rangers who looked for my son. All of them, dead. Then I came to a massive baleti tree. It was so huge and creepy. I had seen century-old baleti trees from other mountains before, but that one was different, yet familiar. I detected the same stench and realized it was the same baleti tree from 10 years ago where I met the Dick Balang. The tree had doubled its size. I overheard a thunderous laughter. Then I finally got a glimpse of the devilish monster sitting beside the tree. The Dick Balang got so big that it seemed to be as tall as the tree. It lowered its head, staring at me mockingly. I shouted at the monster, asking for my son. I gave the huge beast a slap, using all of my might that it echoed throughout the forest. The beast just chuckled, unfazed. I kept slapping him, but he just gave me an evil grin. I came prepared with a dagger that I bought a long time ago. I swung it to its face multiple times and saw how its flesh was torn apart, but I didn't see much blood. Its cuts healed on its own, similar to what I saw with my son's wound. I took a few steps back in dread. The demon horse remained seated and grinned. Then he flung his arm out, and I hit the ground, losing control of my dagger. I was dragged closer to it, and I couldn't break free. Rough stones, small tree branches, and plant thorns pierced my skin, causing pain. It was hot, tingly, and then numb. His razor-sharp claws moved and tore my clothes. You are mine. The Dick Balang declared as another series of lightning flashed in the sky. My son appeared out of nowhere, sprinting towards us and striking the Dick Balang in the stomach with his head. I'm impressed. Not bad, son. The demon horse monster laughed. It seized my son and tossed him to the ground. Ian's body rolled several times before colliding with the tree. I begged him not to hurt him and cried. I told Ian to run and stay away. My son should have been seriously hurt, but something inside him awakened. He got up, saw my dagger, grabbed it, and dashed towards his demonic father as another lightning struck the skies. But he couldn't stand a chance against the Dick Balang, who was too huge and vicious for him. It stood up and snatched my son's neck, lifting him against the Baleti tree. 
The dagger slid from my son's fingers and landed somewhere I couldn't see, but I did see that my son was gasping for air as the monster choked him. I pleaded to the Tikbalang to take my life instead. I cried to the heavens for help. It seemed that the sky was crying with me as the rain got stronger, but the demon wasn't listening. He was just standing there until it let go of my son and fell to its knees like it was hurt. On his back was my husband. Jordan plucked the golden hair from the Tikbalang's nape, immediately jumped on the back of the creature and rode it. I later learned that he asked the elder for help and was told the Tikbalang's greatest weakness. And since then, the enormous monster has been our slave. Harper had been warned by her best friend, don't make unnecessary journeys, and don't date strangers off the internet. Well, Harper didn't listen to any of that. She was spontaneous, she was impulsive, and she met the perfect guy on Tinder. Who knew a human's bite could be so dangerous? She had been dating him for a year now. He was the man of her dreams, the perfect gentleman. He was also a big foodie like her, always whining and dining her the way that she deserved. On that particular weekend, they wanted to keep things low key. Steve's family had a cabin up in the Smoky Mountains, and that was their favorite spot for staycations. She even packed a little surprise. She had the sense that this trip was going to be special. Who knows? Maybe he'll pop the question while they hiked. Everyone had told them to cancel their trip. But Steve was a seasoned hiker, and he knew the Smoky Mountains well. But something was different. An area that had seen a handful of disappearances in the last decade was suddenly seeing one every few weeks. First, they had heard on the news that two young tourists never made it to their checkpoint. A search party went out, but they were never found. Soon after, it was a man on his own taking a solo trip. All that was found by the search party was a single shoe with a little blood on the ground nearby. So the general consensus was that he was eaten by a bear. People kept going missing. Men, women, children. It didn't seem to matter. Fewer and fewer people were willing to take the risk of venturing out there. Especially with all the conspiracy theories popping up online. It didn't help that the media had started digging up the story that started it all. Back in the 60s when little Dennis Martin had disappeared, he had been less than 15 feet from his parents when it happened. He was hiding, about to jump out and scare them. And then he was gone. No one ever found a trace of him, but some nearby campers reported seeing a disheveled man running through the woods, trying to hide from them like a wild thing, and speculation about what that meant had flushed the state. But that's why Harper's friends had started to make a fuss when she mentioned she was going to the mountains that weekend. She decided to go anyway. You know, for a romantic getaway. They arrived at the cabin, and Harper immediately made herself at home. They were there just a few weeks ago, so everything was right where she left them. While Steve was cooking, Harper put on one of her favorite horror movies, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and slipped into something more appropriate for the evening. Do I look good enough to eat? Steve had cooked a lovely steak dinner and they were at the dining table, enjoying each other's company over a bottle of wine. So, what do you want to do this weekend? Jacuzzi? Hike? I'm fine doing anything, even just this. All of a sudden, there was a loud bang on the door. What was that? Harper asked, frightened. Probably a wolf. We are in the middle of nowhere after all. Don't mind it. Harper was concerned. She lost her appetite. The added sound effects of the movie's chainsaw and screams made her paranoid. Relax. Here, let me pour you another glass. Cheers to the weekend, my dear. Harper woke up groggy. When she opened her eyes, Steve was gone. She didn't remember falling asleep. She tried to move her body, but she was paralyzed and couldn't even utter a word. She lay there for what felt like an eternity, wondering what the hell happened. Maybe she drank too much. 
Maybe this was a game, but something kept dragging her back to reality. She didn't mean to dwell on the worst case scenario as she lay there helpless. She was drugged, but it was the only thing that made sense. Slowly, she could move her fingers and toes again. Then, she was able to roll off the bed and search the house. No one was there. So she started calling out Steve's name, no answer. Until she heard distant growls and glass shattering. She panicked, thinking the wolf got inside, and the door suddenly opened. Steve entered the room, shocked to see her up, and tried to calm her down. Harper, I'm sorry, I can't let you go. You'll run away and I need you. We need you. She was terrified. The words sounded hollow even in her own head. Everything felt wrong. I think it's about time you met my family. His family? Right now, it was all so bizarre. Then there was a strange smell. Harper sniffed the air as the smell got stronger and stronger by the second. It was the smell of sweat and rotting meat. She had just enough time to feel a tendril of fear wrap around her heart before she was coughing, gagging on it. I was hoping it wouldn't come down to this, but my dad, he hasn't eaten in weeks. Taurus numbers are down, and you're all we have. In an instant, Steve grabbed her. The tranquilizer wasn't supposed to wear off for another few hours. I wanted to save you the pain. You just need an arm or a leg and we can forget this ever happened. She was choking so hard, she barely noticed when the source of the stench revealed itself. <laughs> Dad, not yet. She needs to be asleep. I don't want her to feel anything. Harper looked up and saw a man. Well, sort of. It was hunched over and dirty, dressed in scraps of rags. But that did nothing to disguise how big it was. If it had been standing tall, it would have been at least seven feet tall. And that wasn't mentioning the muscles that stood out all over its body. The stench continued to roll off of it in waves. The thing was standing a few feet away from her. Its only movement, the steady rise and fall of his chest as he panted mouth slightly open. Harper felt herself freeze. She couldn't stop staring at the creature, and their eyes met. Harper could see the thing looking all over the room, nostrils flaring as it scented the air, and she suddenly felt very, very cold and even more exposed as her heart started racing. Stop looking at her like that. You promised you would only eat on my terms. The creature pounced towards Harper. But Steve got in the way. In an instant, the two were fighting. Harper watched as Steve's dad tackled him to the ground with superhuman strength. Then it bit his neck and started feasting. Harper wanted to puke, but she knew this was her only chance at survival. She managed to grab the tranquilizer and sneak out the room. She found the car keys, her purse, and made her exit. But as she grabbed the front door knob, she heard the dad. It was crying hysterically as it ran towards the door, its face drenched in blood. It looked right at her with pain and anger, and she knew she was its dessert. Another split second of hesitation went by as her body tremored. Then she exited out the door into the darkness. The sudden movement triggered the creature's predatory instinct to chase. So she flung her purse as hard as she could at the creature's face. It bought her a few seconds, making the thing stumble. But she only made it a few feet before she heard a feral howl behind her. Harper tried to tune out everything as she ran towards the car. She wasn't a track star, but it turned out that raw terror could be extremely motivating. She was so focused and almost at the car that she didn't even notice the tree stump until she was tripping over it. Her body twisted in midair, all that momentum being converted, and she hit the ground hard. A grunt escaped her, along with all of her air. And for a moment, she felt like she couldn't get her lungs to cooperate and fill back up. That moment was all the creature needed. It pounced on top of her, reaching out with strong, gnarled fingers, grabbing whatever it could, and putting all its weight on top of her. Harper's face was still pressed into the dirt, so she felt, rather than saw, as the monster got closer to her flesh, snarling and snapping, hot drool dripping down to her skin. Oh, no.
She thought, I am not getting eaten, not happening. She managed to pull the tranquilizer out of her pocket and stab it. It yelped in pain, then opened its mouth and bit down on her arm. The thing's teeth were dull, like a normal human, so it took a massive amount of force for it to tear into Harper's arm, which was excruciatingly painful. Slowly, the creature was hit with drowsiness, and Harper was able to buck the thing off of her. She wasn't sure what she did. She just stirred and shifted from underneath the creature until she had enough leverage to shake loose from its grip and scrambled to her feet. She stood up, breathing a sigh of relief when her arm was only seeping blood, not spurting it. She cast one more glance at the beast, which was fast asleep. Then she noticed the chainsaw next to the tree stump. In an instant, she grabbed the tool and turned it on. She cut off the creature's leg. Then Harper dropped it and ran to her car. Harper didn't stop driving, and she didn't turn until her feet were back on concrete and she was surrounded by the signs of civilization.